Today at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the sun came out and so did the race cars. Except for a brief appearance on Sunday, no cars had been on the track since last Thursday. But today, the track opened on time and teams were treated to over four and a half hours of uninterrupted practice. Uninterrupted, that is, until the rains moved back in late in the day. And then shortly after 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, the track was closed for the remainder of the afternoon. Rumor has it they found Nemo over in turn three. Well, the rain's really pelting this place here late in the day. 31 cars on the track today with Sam Hornish Jr. clocking the fastest speeds of the afternoon. Welcome to Sports Center, presented by Weber Grills at the Indianapolis 500. Well, 31 cars took to the track today with Sam Hornish Jr. clocking the fastest speed of the afternoon. The surprise of the day had to be rookie Townsend Bell, who ran laps consistently over 222 miles per hour in race day trim. Today also marked the first appearance of the month for several new driver team combinations, with Jacques Lazier the fastest among that group. We welcome you back to Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500, along with IndyCar expert Scott Goodyear. I'm Jerry Punch. Glad to have you with us. And Scotty, once again today, Mother Nature called a heart. The practice before the afternoon could be completed. And although we saw cars on the racetracks, the speeds were down quite a bit from what we'd seen last week. Why? Doc, it's all about practice just to get ready for the race. Although we have pole day on Saturday, look for speeds to maybe increase on Friday. But right for today and tomorrow, the only thing that these guys are going to be looking for is race tuning the car to get it ready for the race, and that means full tanks and making sure the car is comfortable out there running in traffic. Well, Scotty, we asked some of the teams about their focus for today. Here's what they had to say. We're going to take every chance we can right now to work on race stuff because, you know, if we figure one or two places in qualifying, it's not going to make a difference. But we have to have a car that we can run all day and run fast and run in traffic with because looking at the pace from the fast guys to the slow guys, we're going to be lapping guys a lot, I think. Right now, we focus obviously on the race setup to make sure that uh, we, we do not have any more surprise and we be ready for the race. It's not probably pole speed but it's enough to get us I think up towards the front and you know we'll uh, we'll get back to working on our our full tank stuff right now but I definitely think between now and and Saturday come qualifying we'll uh, at some point work on qual more, some more qualifying stuff and try to make it a little bit better we've switched back to our T cars um, and you know just trying to put some miles in to try and find out where we are it's been a little hard all the testing we've done so far has been qualifying so it's uh, it's actually finally nice to get uh, some good race running in it was pretty crazy thinking that for us it had been a week since I've been in the car, except for five laps Sunday morning, so that's a, quite a long time. But you know, as long as other guys aren't out there getting miles that you're not getting or getting the opportunity to learn something, you just sort of roll with it. Well, specifically, Scotty, what are they trying to accomplish in race trim here today? You hear everybody talk about the balance and getting the car out there for that race trim, and that's specifically because qualifying, as mentioned, is four laps going as fast as you possibly can. Here you see the Target Chip Ganassi team out there running in tandem, trying to understand what the car does when it's falling behind another car, something you don't experience on qualifying day. So they'll fill the cars up with 30 gallons of fuel, go out there and try and simulate a race situation, going through traffic, having an opportunity to see how the car handles when you got those cars in front of you. Here you see Scott Sharp who's going quite quick all month in a speed of 223.2 today starting to slice through the traffic down the front stretch. He's just looking to run in traffic going out there trying to find cars that he can run behind to see how the car feels in that dirty air as we call it. Well what about the new team that just hit the track here today? What is their goal? Speed or comfort? Well, actually, some of them are looking for speed and some of them are looking for comfort. You get some out there that aren't right now in the bubble. Maybe they need a bit more speed to actually make sure that they get themselves in the field. They're the ones that are looking for that situation. Jacques Lazier, who's actually got a lot of experience here, he's trying for his fifth start. He can help the team get the car up to speed quite quickly. He's trying to make the car comfortable so it will be comfortable in race trim because he knows he's not going to be anywhere close to the front. Here's a look at the seven new driver team combinations who are eligible to practice here today. You see Jacques Lazier, Buckner, Medeiros, Greg Waddle. Dyke Jr., Ayrton Dare, and John Herb among the first to get on the track for their practice laps here today. After being a contender for the poll a year ago, this year the Ray Hall Letterman team has struggled to crack the top 10 in speed, which is not only frustrating, but also a bit of a mystery. I don't think we can run with Penske or, or Ganassi but, uh, for qualifying, but uh, I think we can be competitive after that. And, um, uh, you know, of course, 
you never know really know either. But I think that I think we'll be you know right there with Andretti Green and, and teams like that. What we need to make sure we have is a really good race car so that uh, come the end of the month there on Sunday we give ourselves a shot to win this thing. I don't think our setup was very good. <laughs> I mean. Uh, a little baffling, you know, we did run very well in the test. Uh, Danico, a 224 basically by herself, and and came back and, uh, you know, couldn't get close to that. I think you can make excuses all day long, but Bob's given us the best equipment he can, and we need to make the most out of our equipment. I think if we keep rubbing on this thing, we'll, we'll be back where we think we can be. Without question, at, at some point in time, the a tire is going to be developed for what the, the majority of the cars out there, and that happens to be the, uh, the Delara. I don't think the Firestone tire is built more for a Panos or for a Delar or anything like that. I don't. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just, you know, every year the, the tires changes. Firestone tries to make it more durable, and uh, and they come out with a really good tire. We as a team just need to make sure in our chassis package that we make the most out of what what we're given. Scotty, why do you think they've struggled with that Panos chassis here in the month of May? Well, you know, a lot of talk is that the new tire that's on the car right now, is it better suited for the Delara? You heard Bobby Rahal say, you know, possibly, yes, they might start making a tire that's more for the masses out there. Some question whether Panos will be around next year, and with Bobby Rahal turning around changing chassis here shortly, some wonder whether or not maybe all the development might be going towards that Delara car, which I feel, in my experience that I've had in the past, that's probably what's happening. Although Firestone comes here and they have a couple of Delara cars and a Panos chassis, for instance, with Buddy Rice doing the testing, I got to think that most of the guys are going to turn around and want something different on a Delara car than they would on a Panos chassis. Well, Bobby Rahal has already made the announcement, in fact, he made it today, that they're going to switch to the Delara chassis starting at Texas next month. With all the problems they're having with Panos, why not make the switch now? Well, I'm not so sure it's, it's a big problem area. It's maybe because the, the Panos chassis seems like right now the sweet spot, as they call it, maybe is not as open as it is on a Delara. So everybody that's running a Delara can have a car that actually is burning off the fuel and the chassis is much more comfortable for the drivers to drive. The panel seems to be a little bit more difficult to actually find that sweet spot and when you do, sometimes it falls off of it, especially when the car is very light on fuel in qualifying trim and that's why I look for the panel's chassis guys not to be up there necessarily in qualifying but maybe have a better car throughout the race. Well, Panos or Pontiac, I still believe Buddy Rice and Danica Patrick are going to be a factor on race day. Watch it folks, wherever they qualify they're going to be there when it comes race time. When we return we'll visit with a former two-time Indy 500 winner who returns this year hoping for one more sip of milk in Victory Lane. Al Unser Jr. joins us in just a moment. Sports Center, presented by Weber Grills at the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Weber, making the world a better place, one grill at a time. And in part by Gillette Fusion Hydrogel. Prepare yourself for the best shave ever. In the 1992-500, Al Unser Jr. and Scott Goodyear provided one of the most dramatic finishes in Indianapolis history. After nine tries and six top ten finishes, Unser Jr. looked to claim his first Indy title. The checkered flag is out. Goodyear makes a move. Little Al wins by just a few tenths of a second. Perhaps the closest finish in the history of the Indianapolis 500. You know it is what? now. Yeah, these guys, you should have seen these guys watching that a minute ago. It is now our pleasure to welcome two-time Indy 500 champion Alan Sir Jr. to the show. And Al, you and Scott Goodyear will always be remembered for the closest finish in Indy 500 history. Now, before we talk about this year's race, let's go back to 1992 and have you two guys take us through that final lap. You know, well, I think from my was, point, it was just a chase. Yeah, and from my point, it was just stay, stay in front of Scott. I mean, uh, you know, everybody talks about the, who's won the race. They they hear every bolt, every nut, every every loose thing going down the backstretch on that final lap. Well, I had none of that. I was I was full of Scott Goodyear in my mirrors, and I was just trying to stay ahead of him. And all I was trying to do was just get close enough to get a little bit of a draft from him. You know, it was only my third time there. You've been there since 1984. 
three. So for me, I was just trying to get and run there, and I'm not quite sure I really knew what to do, but all I could sense is that your car just had a bit of a bobble in four, and boy, I was all over that. It did. It did. As a matter of fact, the car got a little bit loose on me up in turn three, and then in turn four, it jumped out a little bit. I had to get out of the gas, and I came off that corner and went, oh, I blew another one. And, uh, and luckily, we got to the got to the checkered line first. You did. If you've never given me the actually part of the check that you promised that day, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> so sure. had promises or promises. <laughs> yeah. okay. It's in well, the mail. What a great finish that was. Now let's fast forward 14 years now. You're back here, at Andy, driving for Dry and Ron Bull team. What was your motivation for coming out of retirement and giving Andy one more shot, Al? Um, I just missed the racing too much. You know, I was uh, there watching all the races on TV and so on, and uh, and I was screaming at the TV, and I just, uh, I had, you know, uh, had my time off and wanted to get back into it, so. You're actually one of three drivers that are coming back out of retirement, obviously. Eddie Cheever being 48 years old, Michael's 43, you're 44. Do you think the drivers in their 40s are maybe not as quick as they are in their 20s and their 30s? I asked Michael that. He just about wanted to hit me, but I want yeah. your take on it. <laughs> um, quite honestly, no. I don't think, uh, if anything, we're, we're better than we were in our 20s. Uh, you know, we can feel the car in, in the first opening laps or what have you when we get out there and practice and we know which direction it's going to go. And so, um, you know, we're, we come in and we go, look, this thing's going to go in it's going to do this and so we need to work on it and uh, and basically uh, you have that experience you know that uh, you know the, the reason why there was the old guard you know Foyt and John Cock and Rutherford and my dad is because uh, you know experience uh, definitely rules over over youth and so on it especially at Indianapolis and so uh, if anything we're better than we were when we were in our 20s. I know you've had limited practice this month but uh, as you look back at your month of May thus far, how competitive can you be in the race this year? Well, if we can get the A1 Team USA Geico car running uh, and handling, we can be a definite threat. And so uh, it's a beautiful race car. We've got a beautiful team. And, uh, and like I said, we've got, we've got that experience that, uh, you know, the first half of the race, you know, we're going to be working to uh, position ourselves for the second half of the race. And, you know, I learned a long time ago and a lot from my father. There's only one lap you want to lead around Indy. And it's the last one. So, what you've done a couple of times. A couple of times. Congratulations again, many times. But after Indianapolis, what are we going to see with Allen's or Junior? Some more races this year. Coming back to Indy next year. What's on um, your plan? Well, we definitely want to come back to Indy next year. You know, um, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna wait and see. You know, the the, the world is our oyster, and uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, go and do some things that uh, that we haven't had the opportunities to do in the past, and so. Uh, you never know. We'll, we'll be doing something. Well, we look forward to your success this year and maybe next year. Now, if you think Allister Jr. wins the Family Award for Courageous Comebacks, you're wrong because his pales in comparison to the incredible efforts of his 19-year-old daughter, Cody. Now, Cody is a remarkable young lady who has been such an inspiration to so many. Her story, which we first told back in February of 1999, bears remembering. was afflicted with a rare special final cord disease called transverse myelitis which left her paralyzed from the chest down. At 12 years old, Cody began rehabilitation and a new life as a spokesperson for the disabled. Now 19, Cody is a freshman at the University of Redlands in California, majoring in biopolitics. It's her ultimate goal to help political leaders understand the science behind research. I've been research. sort of thrown into this world of paralysis and stuff like that and quality of life issues and things that are very, very important to a lot of people. And um, I've just been very inspired to go out and, you know, help a lot of people and get the ball rolling. Al, when you see all that Cody has accomplished uh, in her life over the last seven years, what are your thoughts? Oh, we're just super proud of her. I mean, uh, you know, she was, uh, she gave a uh, talk to the Salvation Army yesterday and, and uh, there was a lunch in there which you guys just played and, uh, you know, she's, she's getting A's and B's in, in college and, uh, and she's just a trooper. I mean, she's, she's, she's so 
inspirational. It just, you know, inspiration just ooze off of her. And, and uh, so it, it, as a parent, I'm just, I, I can't be more proud. You should be very proud. Both you and your dad were there for a standing room only sold out speech that Cody gave here in Indianapolis on yesterday. Hey, thanks for coming by and joining us today. You betcha. Thanks for having us. When we come back, it's all about smiling for the cameras as a couple of Andretti Green Drivers team up and take us along a special photo shoot for one of their sponsors. Welcome back to Sports Center, presented by Weber Grills at the Indianapolis 500. Please note a special time for Thursday's show. Sports Center at the Indianapolis 500 comes your way at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2. We'll be live from the Brickyard for IndyCar Series practice as we get geared up for the 90th running of the Indianapolis 500. While well, qualifying for the Indy 500 is Saturday, and most people in Gasoline Alley are saying the run for the pole should be a battle between Pen Team Penske and Target Chip Ganassi Racing. But, Scotty, let's talk about some of the other teams that may have a chance to close the gap over the next few days. You know, I think with this delay that we've had, there's some teams that are going to take that benefit and use it to try and get their cars going just a little bit quicker. I look at Vision Racing right now. They've come along here. They've actually done a very good job trying to get their cars up to speed. Ed Carpenter is actually very impressive, ran very quick here ever since he arrived in today's speed 221.5 a nice time remember everybody's running in full trim right now Thomas Schechter who led more laps here in the first two races as a rookie than everybody else in the first two times that he came here was very very impressive crashed it into turn three with a cheaper team that particular year but you know that team is really growing it's a second year team Townsend Bell a rookie here has had a great speed he's run for the rookie of the year because I think he is a guy that's going to get to the end of the race because he has a lot of experience in other forms of motorsport those guys are certainly making a lot of progress in a hurry well in tonight's Daily Diary and Dreddy Green teammates Brian Herda and Dario Franchitti take us along on a very special sponsor's photo shoot. Give me that smile. That's perfect. A little bit of teeth is excellent. That's great. Looking good. One of the toughest things about Indianapolis is it's, you know, every day, you know, you're sort of in the media spotlight. There's a lot of autographs, a lot of fans around. It's a busy month for, for media obligations, sponsor obligations, a lot of dinners, a lot of photo shoots like you're seeing today. Work it, own it, own it, make it yours. There you go. Uh-huh. Okay, a little less Scottish, please. The photographer here is really good. He gets it done, he gets the shot done. Some guys like to drag it out a bit. I like the tough guy look, that works. Good. Hint of a smile is okay, too. You're smiling, right? I have no aspirations to uh, have a modeling career for a lot of obvious reasons. We're both approaching that age. I think Marco's the, the future of modeling and the team, so we're going to give him more and more obligations. This stuff isn't exactly fun to do, but um, you know it's important. It's good for us, it's good for the fans, it's good for the team. So you know it's a real win-win. The month of May, we don't really get a day off. You're pretty happy when the when the race comes along because it means you can actually just get in there and do what you like to do. Thank you guys for letting us tag along. Scotty, we understand that you can't race without valuable sponsors, but at what point do all those commitments begin to impact a driver's ability to focus and concentrate? Well, I think the most important thing is here, the month of May, you're here for 21 days directly at this racetrack each and every day. Practice starts 12 noon. A lot of these guys will be going off and doing interviews and sponsor relations first thing in the morning, even before they get to the racetrack. At the racetrack, it's working with the engineer from 12 noon until you get out of the car at six. The evenings are usually full with, again, sponsor relations, going out and talking to the media, going and visiting hospitals, all these things are taxing on everybody's time. Now, as a driver, sometimes you just want to go and escape and sort of focus on how well the day went or maybe how to improve the day that didn't go very well at all. And the most important thing is that when you climb into the cockpit, your head is clear of everything else that you had to do because going into the turn at 230 miles an hour is very difficult to try and get around a 90 degree turn at that speed. When we come back, we got a guy who found an escape. When we come back in just a moment, we'll have a little fun with Spider-Man as a two-time race winner Elio Castroneves becomes our tour guide here for the day. Sports Center presented by Weber Grills at the Indianapolis 500. Brought to you by Weber, making the world a better place one grill at a time. 
Well, Saturday is bowl day here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and ESPN is your home for all the action. From 5 to 6 Eastern, we'll air the final hour of qualifying and the race for the poll live. And from 7 to 10 Eastern, three hours of qualifying coverage comes your way in prime time. Let's take a look at the top speeds of the month, led by last year's winner here, Dan Weldon, who clocked a lap at over 228.6 miles per hour on Sunday. Very quick speed by him. You know, the most important thing, though, in the next couple of days is getting a chance to go out and have your car in race setup, as we talked about. Dario Franchitti did a great job. Ed Carpenter, who we see right now, I think he's going to be a threat for the race at the very end of the day because he's been very, very strong. Townsend Bell, part of that vision racing that we talked about before earlier in the show. Ed Carpenter's teammate, all these guys are going very, 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 very strong. Danica Patrick, got to get that Panos chassis going, and along with Buddy Rice, they're going to have a chance to be there at the end of the day. Diego Medeiros is doing a bit Buddy Lazier, excuse me, doing a very nice job. He's actually about 14th so far this month, and he has an opportunity to uh, maybe be there at the very, very end. Diego Madeiras, running for PDM Racing, guy that has been around for, for a very long time and actually was the Indy Pro Series champion just a couple of years ago. And Ayrton Dare taking over the Sam Smith seat, and he's had an opportunity to get up to speed today. He's going to be trying to be a factor on pole day. All right, Scotty, thank you. Well, as we mentioned earlier, Elio Castro Navas, who currently sits third on the speed charts, is a man of many talents. But how is he at being a tour guide? Let's find out in our Indy After Hours. This is the tour bus, where basically uh, you're going around the track, which is very nice to have some people and knowing the track. So I'm going to be the tour guide today, but I have a special guest inside the bus, and I'll show you who they are. Hello, girls. Hi. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Watch out, people. If I crash this thing, it's not my fault. Oh, by the way, this is the warm-up lane, just in case that uh, you guys haven't noticed. You know what? I think we should go and have a quick stop on the brickyards. I mean, the brick. Yeah. So, okay, now I'm going to be the cameraman, girls. I mean, get ready. Uh, anyway, this is uh, where basically I uh, climbed the fence as soon as I got my first win and also the second one. All right, girls, back to the bus. <laughs> Next stop, my place. Ah. You guys ready to go home? I mean, oh. Oh, all right. -E 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 I think that's it. I hope you guys enjoyed the ride. You like it? Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks, Elio. See you next time. I wondered how we got Elio on that bus. Scotty, practice resumes on Thursday. The forecast is for rain moving back in. How does that impact the teams? Well, another important day. Just get out there as much as possible. Get the race set up going. Try and log some miles to understand what the car is doing and run in traffic, which is going to be the biggest thing for all those teams out there. And especially if rain is going to come on Friday, as we hear, try and get everything done as much as possible and quickly as possible. Well, it was a day when we had sunshine and the rains moved back in. And now as pole days draw is nearer from Saturday, the teams are in the garage area watching and waiting and wondering if they have whatever it takes to sit on the pole on Saturday here at Indianapolis. So long, everyone. I'll do whatever.